Hello, today we have Mohammed, we have Jan and Igor and Dave and Jamie, myself, Michael, and I've just returned from Asia BSDCon where I promoted these talks on the FreeBSD Developer Summit and at the a closing work in progress session. Today we have a presentation by Dave on his work with Zero Tier. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. So um, this sort of carries on from around 2016 when I did a talk at um, uh, BSD Can, and um, at the time I was working with a with in a small company where we had a bunch of um, Debian machines across multiple cloud providers, and originally that was the goal was you know, cloud resiliency, and the problem was that introduced a lot of latency, so we ended up squashing them all back down to an ever decreasing number of FreeBSD servers adding more and more jails. And at the time I wasn't perhaps as familiar as I am now with networking. So we kept it quite simple. Um, the, I suppose that the main thing that of interest here is, is, is the networking side of it. So I'm gonna skip most of the boring sort of general jail details, but the, the guts of it is we originally had about 30, I think 30, 33, 34 VMs and each connection between every other VM was encrypted with um, over SSH, which wasn't ideal. It would, it would flake out periodically, and then it would reconnect. Um, and in between, whatever application was running would obviously have a few problems as, it ne as its networking disappeared. Uh, pragmatically, every connection to every other server sort of created this N plus one factorial mess of connections to manage. And every time we wanted to make a change or um, add a machine or a service, the complexity just got worse. So that was the, the overall goal was to reduce that complexity right down. Um, the first round of consolidation trimmed everything down to uh, a build server, which ran Perdria and a bunch of monitoring and various things like that, and some ephemeral jails to do typical CI stuff. So build, container, um, package, push the package out for distribution via um, Pudger and package, and then clean up the jail for, for the next run. Um, the services themselves ran across a two node FreeBSD cluster um, with CARP and, and PFSync. And this was fine for people who were comfortable with FreeBSD and, and Linux as well, but didn't really work for people who were not sysadmins. The company was small enough that there wasn't really anyone who solely did that and that was one of the things i wanted to address um, in sort of the next round uh, we've talked a bit about the n squared complexity explosion every time we add a service um, every single other container needs to connect to every single other container and that just gets worse and worse um, the next version of, of this uh, left the s pipe d to, um, connections everywhere and left the um, N plus one connectivity problems, um, but we put BGP in the front. And the really nice thing about that was we moved the cluster um, state from being in the kernel and we moved it up to user land. And the, the best example of this is to think about where the traffic comes from. Um, comes out outside from, from users, hits the cluster, and needs to be directed to um, an up jail, a jail that has the application running it, which could be on either of the nodes um, and a multiple jails. And um, when we had this being handled in the kernel, um, the kernel itself doesn't know that a given jail is up and it has no way of knowing where it can send the traffic. And by moving this into um, BGP and user land, it became much simpler. The server is up, it's not accepting traffic. Um, it announces its presence over BGP when all the demons that we need are up and running and only then. Um, and in this particular case, HA proxy is already running. So um, once we start accepting traffic, external traffic over BGP, it can immediately hit HA proxy. And HA proxy is smart enough to know, okay, I have a local jail that's running and available so I can send the traffic to that or okay, for some reason that jail is down or it's in maintenance or it's being upgraded. 
So I will send the traffic to another node that is up and the container is running on it. And that separation has actually worked really well. And um, I've experimented with running a BGP announcer actually inside the application itself. So the application starts up and once it's running, its final stage is to do its own little BGP announcing. Um, hey, I'll, yeah, and I'll come back to your questions at the end because otherwise I'll just lose track of where I am, yeah? But they're all good questions. We've got some questions at IRC. Um, the first round of BGP stuff was done at NetBatch 8, which was called RootBSD then. And now it's at um, packet.net, which is called Equinix Deploy these days. Um, and they've got a really nice API and a programmable BGP layer. So it's very, very cool networking there. Um, the third version around 2018, so the latency that's experienced by users because of having so many um, disparate servers was eliminated once we went to this little um, three node FreeBSD cluster because it's all local hosted then, but it still has the system administration overhead of every container needs to talk to every other container. And that was really the next thing I wanted to address. At the time, when I did the first migration around 2016 and 2017, all of this sort of software defined networking was, was pretty new. And we didn't really want to put all of our eggs in one basket, change operating systems, um, change our server, the way our servers were architected, and also introduce a new way of networking, just too much change at once. So we ended up just leaving that networking for later. And um, there were probably three main choices at the time when we did this. Uh, there was doing something with IPsec, which would be very nice and secure, it would be very fast. But from what I would I could see, it didn't really change the complexity of having to make configuration changes on all the systems every time we added an application. Uh, the other choice was zero tier, which was, uh, sorry, not zero tier, was um, WireGuard, which was very new. And I don't think was available in any form on, in FreeBSD at that time in 20, 2018. Uh, but it certainly was pretty new. Um, zero tier was in ports, and I picked up maintainership of it and um, brought it up to date. And um, started moving it in slowly. Uh, so not everywhere all at once, but little by little by little. Uh, the first piece I put it in was actually for logging. So the containers, the jails actually do all of their logging over syslog. Um, but syslog we actually use syslog ng and for that we can do buffering locally if the network is down so we end up in this nice little situation where i i'm not reliant on having the the networking working 100 percent of the time if there's a problem with it um the local syslog ng daemon will buffer traffic and when the connection is back up or working properly again then uh, it'll just shut it all through and catch and keep and and and, um, and keep and bring itself up to date. Um, having said that, I don't think we really had any problems ever with the logging side of it, and it made maintenance really really simple. So we started moving it further and further inside the stack. Uh, the next layer was a new at the time a new app and a language called Elixir, which is a uh, Closure-esque, Ruby-esque flavor of um, Erlang, uh, which is a language I was, I'm still very, very familiar with. And it has very nice IPv6 support. So what we did is um, we put the um, application itself on what Zero Tier calls the six plane. Um, and I'll come back to this. Um, I'll come back to this in a minute. Uh, but basically every um, you can think of it, this is, is um, the IPv6 equivalent of um, an RFC 1918 um, private address space with the proviso that every IP address is generated through an algorithm that, um, that you can work out in advance. So if you know the, um, the server credentials and the... Um, uh, 
how do I describe that? This, there's an algorithm for it. It's probably I, I won't I won't try and run through it off the top of my head. But if, if it's um, it's deterministic, so if we know the network node we're connecting from, and we know the um, uh, encryption key, the public encryption key used, we can then work out what the IP address um, for each for each system is. Um, with zero tier, it's a tap uh, ton tap interface, and I am sure there are some limitations on that, but in our testing, um, it's pretty easy to get over over seventy percent um, of of the raw wire speed as measured by like IPF three without really any tweaking, and that's and that's sufficient. Um, if the path isn't symmetric, um, it's not nearly as good, and there are some catches. Um, if you're pushing a lot of traffic through through zero tier, then your non zero tier traffic. Um, can be impacted, or is it the other way around? Um, yeah, if you're pushing a lot of normal traffic through, then your zero tier traffic can be slowed down. Um, yeah. So, what would we like to cover with this? We're actually here to talk about jails. So, let's have a look at that. Um, the architecture that we that we ended up, which is which has proved pretty good, is on each server, um, you want to talk to um, some service, and we don't want that that jail to have to know where that service is. So what we have is um, HA proxy runs on every single um, server, and it provides in, in the carrier grade NAT range, this 100.64.0.0 range, um, it provides a sort of a well-known address. So if you're talking, uh, I don't know, let's say SMTP, which which we don't use, but if we did, um, it would be on port. Uh, I've got a brain fart. What port is SMTP on these days? SMTP, uh, still 25. It is 25. Yeah, it's completely gone. Okay, cool. So 25. You'd have, you'd have HA proxy Unless listening on port 25. That's 587. Yeah, so let's just go to 25 at the moment, but it's listening on that. And um, when a local jail wants to talk to the service, it has to ask HA proxy, um, find this service for me. And HA proxy has the load balancing awareness to know that um, right now the the demon you want to speak to exists in another jail on the same host. So it's basically local host traffic and really fast. Or to go, no, that one's down for the moment. So I'm going to send you to one of the other nodes that is up and it's another jail on another system. And we actually route that over zero tier, which makes it super easy uh, because zero tier knows how to get from node to node and HA proxy just knows what is up and what is down. And I guess these days we call that a service mesh, um, but uh, yeah, that's that's kind of how it works. So let's look at our zero tier interface here. We've got one zero tier interface. I'll just scroll a little bit. Can I Can I scroll? Is it too much to ask? There we go. All right. I can't get exactly what I want. I'm going to switch to Markdown view for this. I think it'll be quicker. All right. Okay. Is that still readable? Yes. Yeah, good enough. Cool. All right. So let's make. Okay, how's that then? Yep, that's pretty cool. That's good. That's the best of both worlds. Okay, so here's our zero tier interface. It's, um, it's, so from our kernel perspective, this is a single ton tap um, interface here. And um, we can see it's got a nice big fat MTU of 2800. That's the default in zero tier. And I've tried using smaller and larger numbers. And I don't know how they chose it, but it actually works pretty well. So we leave it as the default. Um, we have here one zero tier. This is the primary IPv6 that assigned. You can see there's no IPv4s assigned at all to this host. So the only way a jail can talk to another system is going over zero tier. So it's a very nice little security boundary. Um, this one here is assigned to the host and every single one of the subsequent addresses are all assigned to an individual jail. So here we have, uh, I don't know what, 
I don't know what number two is, uh, but number three is CouchDB. And if we were to go and check for that, there'd only be two things listening. Actually, let's go and have a look at one right now because we can do that. Uh, There we go. There we go. Okay. Uh, what did I say? Five nine eight four. Okay. So here we can see there's only two processes listening on this port. One of them is um, our local HA proxy. It's providing the remap address, the, the service mesh, if you like. And in the background on this node as well, because it's a database, FO2 is a database host. There's also the actual daemon itself listening. The CouchDB daemon is running on this zero tier address. So any jail that wants to talk to CouchDB has to talk via HA proxy. And um, the CouchDB itself can talk over this zero tier address to one of its other uh, friends. So let's go and do that. Ping, uh, ping six. What did I say? I9. Dot. There we go. And if we do a curl, because CouchDB is an HTTP compliant database. Um, the port number and uh, we get a nice message back. I've done that right. Oh, have I done something wrong? Oh, of course I have. Yeah, we'll get you got to talk to a CouchDB. Okay, so the CouchDB itself is a clustered database. So this, we have a three node cluster, um, C01, C002, C03. We went out all that on the naming. And when I need to do database maintenance or if some sort of extended downtime I actually can scoop up all of jails because they're just ZFS data sets, move it to another box, um, restart zero tier on that node, on the new node. And um, the IP address, the zero tier IP address we're using for things to connect to doesn't need to change. And this has just been, um, so amazing for maintenance, um, server migrations and stuff. It's absolutely fantastic. The combination of um, ZFS for for making all of our jails really just packageable, and zero tier for the the uh, the network virtualization makes doing maintenance really really simple. Um, so we need to bear in mind that every application doesn't talk directly over IP addresses. It uses a DNS name, and those always resolve to a zero tier address, and that's how. Um, our little Erlang cluster database works. Each of the three nodes in this cluster talk to each other over IPv6, and they don't care what server they're on. They just care that, and on this IP address at this port, um, this node in the database exists. And I guess this is now, let me think now, uh, seven, seven years old, six or seven years old now, and it's moved hosting providers repeatedly um, but the DNS name has never changed, and the zero tier IP address has never changed, but the server itself has. Uh, we pick up the server, um, we copy the um, uh, so zero tier here has like a like a secret auth token, um, public and private key components here, and um, a bunch of configurations that aren't really too important for the moment. But so long as we move these two secrets, um, the public and private um, private key, uh, to another node, when it restarts, um, it magically starts announcing its presence um, from a, a physical different server, which has a completely different IPv4 range to, to the previous one. And zero two just makes all that seamless. Um, yeah, so omits for jails. So the guts are here. Every jail gets its own IPv6 address in this um, private um, IPv6 space called the six plane. And every zero tier node knows immediately um, that this component here, I think it's up to around about that. The first sort of third is the network name. 
um, the next um, sort of part is a host section and then there's a few bytes at the end um, I guess it's uh, I think it's a, a 40 or an 80 I can't remember is it's actually on that specifically per, on that node, per ADR, node. I think it's an 80 yeah um, so normally with IPv6 if you want to know what node you're going to find an address on use a thing called um, I think NB, NPD NDP um, Neighbor Discovery Protocol, NDP. NDP, great, thank you. Yeah, so in NDP, and you do like a, the equivalent of a little broadcast to find out what's uh, what's nearby or if you need to go through a router. And Zero Tier Cheats handles, handles this traffic internally itself and says, if you're trying to get to something that's within the same slash 80, by definition, it must be on this node already. So let's just look locally and see what we have. Um, if it's out there, outside that slash 80, um, it can use the the remaining prefix to work out um, where to route that. And the result is for local traffic, it's pretty quick, uh, which is great. Um, next up, so we actually have a real one, so we can just look here. Uh, I did a nice bit of LibXO parsing there to get this, didn't I, at the time. I suppose that was maybe too clever. Um, so on this particular host that I looked at, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, I guess it's six applications. Um, and you can see there's zero tier addresses on the right and then normal loopback um, addresses on the on the left here. So if this um, www is a pretty standard server, so the traffic is coming in from the outside and hits HA proxy and HA proxy will um, route the traffic to whichever one of these um, one of these is up. Let's see if I can get um, some of the Ansible code to look at. Uh, 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 might take me a couple of goes to find the name here. So if you don't care about leaking this information, you, uh, because you have a slash 48, uh, suffix for each host you could just um embed the jail id and yeah i could do yes you're right so um that's Let's actually you would I'll get talk another layer of embedding and then you yeah. wouldn't even have to track this mapping because you have a one-to-one -one correspondence and yeah so that's actually a great point because that's exactly what i did in my my own jail manager which I never replaced it in production because this the production stuff works. So why would you change it? Um, yeah, here we go. Here's my Ansible piece. Let's switch back to the view. I did, I did, I did the Ansible stuff in here. So I don't know how familiar people are with HA proxy, um, but hopefully it's not too bad. Um, yeah, I can't. So what we have, what we have here. Let's see if we can fiddle with the screen size oh, that's better isn't it so i guess people can't see that as well but hopefully that's good enough um with an ha proxy we have a front end which is your listening um sort of service and then we bind here just like you would in nginx um, add a couple of relevant headers and then we send that traffic to a back end and the back end is where we do the load balancing um we've got a few requirements here about how does that proxy decide if one of the services up so that's its HTTP check. Um, it's expecting to get a status 200 back. And if it gets a 404, um, then it disables it. So you have a choice between saying, okay, if access is denied, um, does that count as the application is down? Or is it just the application saying you don't have permission? And for CouchDB, um, in this case, a 404 means we got it terribly wrong, we should fix it. So uh, we disable that, yep. Um, we have a three node cluster and Within Ansible, we actually order these. Um, I, I didn't put it in here, but we order these by um, the physical node that they're running on. So you always get to speak to your local CouchDB if there is one. Um, so local, uh, if there's a local application jail and it wants to talk to the database and there's a database instance on this host, then it goes directly there. If not, you get sent elsewhere. Um, and there's some sort of pretty standard Ansible variable lookups here that says the First instance of CouchDB for the server is on this IP address, which is an IPv6 address in our case, and it's on the standard CouchDB port. 
And I think there's, yep, and we do some checking as well. So if there's traffic flowing in HF proxy, then we assume it's up. So HF proxy has that, that check. If you're already sending traffic, clearly the service is up. Um, and that means we're not continually sending health checks for busy nodes that are running anyway. Um, cool. Yep. So, so far that's with Ansible. Inside the jail itself, the jails aren't aware about the service mesh. So they're not aware about the zero tier layout. Um, so you can see here this CouchDB daemon here. This is a CouchDB daemon here. It's got a bind address of IPv6, any IPv6. Now there's only one IPv6 address in this jail. And so the default address automatically is available over zero tier and only zero tier. And down the bottom, because CouchDB is a clustered database, we tell it a little bit about the other nodes here. And here you can see that this node is um, the CouchDB jail, and it's located on the C01 server, in our case, the C01 IP address. Um, and there's the second node in the cluster there. And somewhere down here, we've got the third node. Yeah. Um, there's a little bit of PF magic so that um, if you're not, um, you can't connect to um, the internal cluster port unless you're coming from the cluster jail. That's not very exciting, pretty standard PF stuff. And um, when we look um, on, on this node here, uh, what have we got? Oh, we already looked at that earlier. Yeah, we've got um, our uh, CouchDB node here. And um, uh, which one is this here? 437. This is Erlang's internal clustering um, services. We've got a couple of demons here that help Erlang locate the other node. Um, right. Yeah, so sort of taking it like back up to the top, the Three main changes here was BGP makes it really easy to separate the um, availability of, a, of the applications running on a system from the node being up. So when we're using PF and, and, and PF sync, the main problem was as soon as the server comes up, PF starts very early because it's a networking daemon and all of a sudden your system's accepting traffic, but you haven't started HA proxy, you haven't started any jails and you're not ready to do the traffic. Um, also, because it's a user land daemon, it makes it really, really simple to do upgrades. We can just um, disable BGP, restart the node, and when it comes up, you can do all your FreeBSD updates, everything like that, um, without accepting any traffic from the outside. Then you can bring up zero tier, then you can bring up the jails, and you can wait for the cluster to catch up with any backlog traffic. And when the cluster is up, then finally you can go back and turn BGP on and, um, and let traffic. Uh, let traffic flow. Um, yeah, so this kind of segues neatly into where we're at with jails for me. Um, a lot of this stuff is pretty dynamic now, but the jail info is static and it's done at install time. So I can't do anything nice and clever that, uh, for example, it says there should be at least three application servers and there should be at least one in each continent. Um, there's no way to do that. And so a lot of this stuff is done um, almost in advance. The jails are prepared in advance, they're deployed in advance, and we rely on HA proxy and zero tier to ensure that traffic gets sent to the local jail and only gets sent um, cross continent or cross um, to a different server if the local one is unavailable for, um, for some reason. Um, just a little bit on CI, not very exciting here. Um, we have a, a webhook. So I don't know how familiar people are with, with webhooks, but I guess 2014 webhooks really became a big thing uh, in the Node.js world and they were published everywhere. And the general idea is every time an event happens on some system, um, GitHub, GitLab um, being great examples of this, also the open source um, Gitty and, and its various flavors, um, all these support um, publishing a webhook, which is just an HTTP post request to a given URL um, every time something of note changes. And you can subscribe to these. And this is how everything's wired together. So as soon as we get a code change, um, it's pushed to, uh, in this case, this one here is GitHub. We receive a post request and this little webhook 
daemon and ports has a signed HVAC, so it knows it's, it's, it's a valid request. It does a little bit of JSON passing, and then it hands those parameters over to an Ansible script, which does all the boring work of um, running packages, um, updating servers, um, and that sort of stuff here. So that's actually pretty nice. Uh, really nice little simple bit of automation. Um, yeah. So the bits that are missing, um, CIA doesn't do ephemeral jails. Um, our deploy script is really simple. It just says, I got a new deploy. Um, I will roll back the jail and then I will do some basic security, hopefully sufficient locale, path, temp do, you mask. Um, it needs some privileged tokens because it's going to do a deploy. And then um, it runs Ansible from Git and um, kicks Ansible to redeploy the application at the end of it. And for, for, for our purposes, um, every application is a jail. And inside that jail, it's just a package. So if we want to deploy a new version of something, we build a new package and then we push the new package out and then restart um, the daemon. And we do that in series. So what HA proxy sees is the first node goes down, um, the package is upgraded, traffic is sent to the other active jails, uh, which are on different servers while this is happening. The server then comes back up, and when it comes back up, HAProxy sees it's up, traffic starts flowing to that box, and then Ansible goes, okay, the first node is done, I'm allowed to go to the second node. And when the second node is done and back up, off it goes to the third node. Uh, it's okay, it's not great. Um, so for jail stuff, um, we don't really use ephemeral jails. We don't have enough builds for that to be necessary. Um, a ZFS rollback is good enough. So ephemeral jails would be nice. Um, the original code is a- Dave, how are you of, defining an ephemeral jail? Um, the jail is called CI <laughs> in this case, right? And it runs on mainly on one host with a couple of backup ones. And an ephemeral jail would be, I get a web hook, I spin up a new jail, with what it's supposed to have, push the bits in, run the build, extract the package, tear it down again. Yep. And that's kind of, um, that would be tidier. Um, at the moment, we rely um, on some state, um, some package files being in a certain place, these sorts of things. And it would be much cleaner if it was just an ephemeral jail each time. So created entirely from scratch. Um, come back to questions. So I'll start off with Jan's one, and then I'll go through what else we what, also a whole pile of stuff in the end Zoom as well. So how does the control plane interface with Zero Tiers API? By design here, nothing. Um, we can have a quick look at Zero Tiers. Um, uh, I think I can log in here. I've got a Zero Tiers we can use. That's my Personal one. I should be able to do a GitHub. Uh, I don't want to do all of this while I'm online. Okay, I was hoping it would just come up. Um, let's see, can I do it over here? I'll do this in another window so I don't. Um... Okay. Tuesday. All right, this year. Um, yeah, so this isn't the work one, this is the, the private one. This is what Zero Tier sort of interface looks like. You can have a single, you can create through your API multiple networks. There's no real cost uh, for that, um, but it makes um, managing traffic a little bit more tricky. Um, so for every zero tier network that we create, 
every host would have a new TunTap interface for that network. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between a, a zero tier network. Um, you can think of like a like a, like a subnet really, um, a zero tier network and um, a TunTap interface. That would be really nice. I've thought about this because then I could use um, I could put that uh, interface uh, into a jail and it would have its own interface. Um, but it's not easy to define rules for flowing traffic between these networks. And then I would have to do almost all of that with PF. So that, that maybe there's a way to do that. I, I'm not sure whether I can route traffic between separate networks. So here we can see, here I've got no IPv4 set up at all in, in this network. Um, and down here, I've got this, this six plane address here um, with a slash 80 for each device where we put jails onto it. Um, I'm pretty sure on the production side of things, we have auto assign from range here set um, as well. That's only um, if you want uh, global IPv6. Uh, for public, for public IPv6, you mean, is it? or Yes. If you, you yeah. want something other than the six plane or RFC, uh, 4193. Ah, there we go. Right. Yeah, so we could use a real address range for that. Actually, that's interesting. That, and that, the that nodes could have, been useful. Uh, have to be configured in their local.conf to accept uh, global addresses. So global IPv6 unicast or non RFC 1918 uh, IPv4 addresses mm. at all per network. Yeah. Um, Just as with yeah, so, litigation. So for, for zero tier, this kind of looks. Um, that's a good example here. Um, that's a Mac downstairs. <laughs> it's online and it's running 1.8.9. Um, a bunch of different ones here. This is our kind of family stuff. So there's a whole bunch of things that are on or off. Um, and you can see here, these ones are all at home behind a physical IP. Um, all this information is available from the command line as well, which is pretty nice for, for zero tier. Um, but the provisioning for this is all automatic. So um, zero day has a pretty solid API, uh, but the only thing I really use it for is provisioning nodes. Um, and that's a pretty, uh, it's just, um, okay. Um, where do we put the ISL? Let's just have a look at all of these here. Um, Cause there's a jail call after all. So, In Ansible, when we create our, our jails, there's a, um, a bunch of loops around. This is ISL. It's a very simple shell script, and there's really not been any need to change it. Up until you get to about um, a couple of hundred jails, ISL works just fine, and it starts to get bad after that because um, it shells out to ZFS commands all the time to get various bits of data. And if you have hundreds of jails, then your system spends a lot of time um, grouping up waiting for um, ZFS TXGs to pass before it can collect that data. Uh, and after that point, after like 100 jails, I switched to a different system, which is um, less convenient, but much, much more resilient to, uh, it doesn't require, it, it, um, it doesn't have, have to look up data all the time. Um, yeah, so there's three phases set up, which is pretty straightforward. Um, this is the very boring um, sort of, Installing packages uh, where we get set up. Um, we reorder stuff to make sure HA proxy starts before jails are up. And this ensures that um, we can accept traffic coming in from the internet and route that around this node, even if the jails haven't started. Um, and we install releases and tables, pretty straightforward, and some custom fact collectors, which we don't really care about. Um, the templating is where the interesting stuff happens. Oops. Um, the main template, yeah. Template here. Um, most of this will be pretty familiar to you. We have um, a, an entry template, which is just a, a, a tarball, um, and we write various config files into it and um, a bunch of packaging, pretty straightforward. And um, yeah, here's our DNS resolver going in. Uh, we make a, a few soft links because um, 
when we do this with package, um, it uh, it doesn't install them, or at least it didn't when we did this, I don't know, 2017, 2018. Um, we turn off a bunch of daemons that don't make sense in jails, cron, NTP, SSH, um, syslogd. There's no syslogd in our jails. It's all um, Unix sockets provided by syslogng outside the jail. And that's a trade-off. Um, the choice you have is you can either run syslogd inside the jail, then if an attacker gets in, they can waste all the disk space in the jail, but they could also tamper with the logs. And so we have gone for the other choice, which is there's no syslog capability in the jail at all. So as soon as the attacker gets in, we're guaranteed to get logs transported offsite. The downside is um, if the if the attacker decides to try and um, crash the system by generating a lot of logs, then we might see that in the parent system. Um, but I think it's a good trade-off. Um, it's a reasonable choice. So yeah, disable cmail. Everyone does that, and a little bit of information to help us organize the plumbing. And then finally, we um, do some package installs. I think that's about it. Package repos, a bunch of tools that we like. So all this is in a template, and that means every time we create a jail, um, it's got all these bits in it. I don't think there's anything else of note. Yeah, so let's look at our last one. Um, sorry. Back to here, deploy, deploy. And this is the bit I really don't like. This is the bit I'd love to get rid of. Um, it's very fragile. When I say it's very fragile, what I mean is every couple of years, I need to go through and figure out why Ansible um, has failed to um, deal with this sort of stuff like this correctly. Ansible loves to change things. And every couple of years that breaks. It's not really a jails problem um, or a zero tier problem. Um, and you can sort of see here, this is our, you'll recognize it in general. It looks something like a jail.com file. Um, there's a release, a host name, um, the IP address goes in here, but this is not really very friendly, is it? Uh, if you if you go through it slowly, it all makes sense. We've got a private name for the interface. If it's not present, we use loopback one. We have some sort of um, jail related IPv4 address, and if we don't have one, we assign a default. Um, we have the same thing for IPv6, and we have this lovely little bit of Ansible here <laughs> that does the right thing um, and ensures that if we have an IPv6, this is when it's signed. Yeah, which is to hash it off the off the jails, off the jail you know, names. Yeah, uh, to uh, give up the uh, key equals value format for properties, but instead use a sub object. And uh, assume the problem you encountered with that is that now you have keys you want to have or not have depending on your configuration. It looks like it would be impossible at first sight, but hidden deep in the Ansible documentation, there is the special token omit which you can assign to a key to uh, remove it effectively. So assigning the variable omit to, for example, release or IP6 address would just remove the IPv6 address from the uh, object it's part of. Right, so, we, we need to have multiple lines here set though, so. No problem. We've, yeah. Anyway. You can change I don't like this piece and I would love it to be different. It's one of the things that's tricky, but at least from a jails perspective, it look, should, should look pretty straightforward um, if, if messy. Um, and here we have the little bit that, that mounts the jail data sets inside um, the, 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 how do I describe this, the ephemeral jail. This is actually pretty brilliant. Um, when we do upgrades, um, can we go back to... Uh, Using, isn't it? Um, yeah, let's just make that a little bigger. So we've got a bunch of jails here and um, jail. What you'll see here is um, here's the actual jail containers. And most of these will have just three things in them. They'll have one or two config files, your classic user local ETC something. 
and they'll have some data files in here that have real data that we want to keep um, that's not ephemeral, so it's your permanent storage, and they'll have some stuff related to logging. And so all of our jails follow the same sort of pattern. There's a default template. There's a ZFS data set that mounts in, in our case, this CouchDB one has um, the actual databases are here, and it's got um, a separate ZFS data set that contains the ephemeral, not the ephemeral, the, um, the materialized views. So I only need to back up the data because the views could always be recalculated um, from, from the restored data. Um, a couple of other DBs and a couple of other applications. But that's pretty much the same pattern. And we can just, uh, in fact, we have this little script called excoriate, which literally just removes, um, this is how we do upgrades. Uh, oh, probably do sudo for that, Larry. Uh, um, that, that's how we do upgrades. Um, it's part of a wider Ansible script that does the looping over servers, but we turn off BGP, so there's now no traffic to that server. That means all the other servers take traffic. And then we do a snapshot, um, make a boot environment, shut down all the jails, and we destroy all of the jails um and clean up and then after reboot ansible will just rerun and um recreate all of these jails and the permanent data lives in this jailed data sets and um is magically mounted in and that's made upgrades absolutely absolutely cake i couldn't imagine doing this any other way oh, it's really really awesome um yeah, so back to back to our questions. What do we have here? Uh, I see. Um, where do you run zero tier? So zero tier runs on inside each host at the moment. Um, if I ran it, yeah, so I had two choices here. I could run a zero tier inside every uh, jail, but that to me seems like a lot more work. Um, and um, the other choice I had was to create a separate um, zero-tier interface or, or network for every single jail or application. So our CouchDB cluster might be one network, but then I now need to invent routing again to send traffic between each of the nodes. Um, how much control traffic overhead do I see? Not much. Um, people who use zero tier over mobile um, notice. Um, I will just have a look here. Um, okay, live top. Um, yeah, so you can see here, um, uh, it's moving around a baby bit, bit too much to see over Zoom, but. Um, the zero tier traffic itself, this this Google user one here is actually, um, I just moved again to note, here's some zero tier stuff. It's like 1K a second, maybe. Um, so in our, from my perspective, it's irrelevant. <laughs> it really, it's um, under 1K a second of traffic being sent um, to maintain the zero tier mesh. Um, when we first set up this network, um, it's kind of an interesting story. Um, it was in DigitalOcean. Well, some of it was in DigitalOcean, and DigitalOcean at the time was really flaky. We were losing connectivity on a regular basis, um, and um, our at that time our SSH connections we weren't using zero tier. Our SSH connections would fail, timeout, reestablish themselves. And when we put zero tier in for this, there are two things. First of all, zero tier is topology aware, so um, it knows. Um, It knows there's an IPv4 connectivity between nodes. It knows there's IPv6 connectivity between nodes. And it is also aware that there's a 10 slash subnet in some of our infrastructure that is private and local and much faster. And so Zero Tier knows all about that. So what we found was when we put Zero Tier in while DigitalOcean was doing this, this migration work that they were doing, um, we stopped having outages because 
um, zero tier would automatically resend the traffic um, over IPv6 if IPv4 wasn't working. And um, if the traffic was local within the same sort of DigitalOcean data center, for want of a better word, um, it could send it that way. Um, I've since been told that DigitalOcean spent uh, maybe a, two, a couple of years consolidating all of their BGP um, um, autonomous systems. And that was why there were so many outages was because as they cleaned up another part of their network space, they would remove an AS and let the traffic flow through another one. And that's why we had lots of outages. But zero tier really made that that problem go away, um, which is great. Um, what have we got here? Do you use zero DNS? No, it did not exist at the time. It would have been better. Um, so, yeah, zero DNS is another project that's not part of zero tier itself, um, and it just ensures that systems that are um, named in the zero tier control panel, um, let's have a look here, like uh, here's my iPhone called DCH, yeah, and um, a Linux, uh, Linux computer downstairs, um, that node would then appear in DNS and be up to date. Um, my stuff isn't very dynamic, so we have this in normal DNS and it never changes because um, when we move a server from one location to another or from one provider to another, um, we keep the zero tier private and public key for that node. And so DNS doesn't need to change either. And our application doesn't need to change. Um, what else? Do you run your own moons? So zero tier has this concept of um, uh, root servers, which is kind of, you can think of them a bit like the top level of DNS. Um, they need to be on all the time. Unlike DNS, they don't get a lot of traffic and they don't do a lot of work. And their job is to say, oh, for this network, here are publicly addressable entry points for it. Um, some people don't like that and they want to run their own versions of this. Um, we don't because that information is not really very um, private for us. Um, and most of the servers are already publicly accessible because people use them. They're the, they're things that customers need to connect to. So it's not like we are leaking information that wasn't publicly available anyway. Um, but you can run your own moons. I have had a great deal of difficulty running that on FreeBSD, um, originally because the hardware I was using, Intel Atoms, um, were not new enough. Um, and I personally have never run it successfully. Uh, maybe I should try that again sometime. Um, but the main advantage is that you run your own moon and you can think of it like as this sort of stable point in the network that your zero tier nodes um, would orbit um, to look up, to look up for traffic. Right. Um, what other questions have we got here? Uh, Oh, cool. We've got some information from Jan about the MTU size. Nice. Um, yeah, regarding jails, let's have a quick look while we're on the subject at my uh, Jay-Z script. Um, so let's start off as a toy just for, for fun. And um, that sort of became my <laughs> um, exploration into jails proper. Um, and... I don't have this here, uh, but in another system, um, I do a lot of CI-based work for jails, um, lots and lots of them. And this is kind of how we do it now. So the standard jail stuff is make some jails, um, have a ZFS data set, unpack the tables for FreeBSD, put a basic configuration in them, and then snapshot that. And then every time you make a jail, you clone this off. So um, picking some choice points out in the script here. This is the Jay-Z function, um, which makes a jail. It relies on a couple of things. Um, if the name of the jail already exists, then we, so if the jail doesn't already exist, then we clone it from the template um, with a snapshot pristine, yeah? And that's pretty straightforward. Um, we make, a, a, a fake unique name and a UUID almost 
based off um, a SHA-5112 hash of the jail name and then cut a couple of digits out of this. And we use this as the first, um, as the first, uh, or as the last two bytes of um, our IPv4 and our IPv6 address, uh, which is pretty gross, uh, but it actually works fine for ephemeral jails. We've we've never had a clash, um, and we plumb that into our jail command here, somewhere down the bottom here. Where is it? Uh, oh, here it is. Here we can see here we make our loopback address with our the I the IP address we made earlier, um, and then all the jail stuff you're familiar with, and that actually creates this one in a, in a T mux. So I use this locally for making jails for just for you know running something in, and um, a slightly different version of this runs in production where every job that comes in, uh, every webhook we receive a commit, we create. Um, an ephemeral jail using as much of the tail end of the of the hash as we can. Um, and because it's IPv6, we actually have a lot of space to play with. And we're pretty sure that those are always going to be unique. So every jail comes up with a unique name from its um, IPv6 thing. And the end of it, we clean up, shut down the jail, um, and spawn the next one when the next job comes in. And that's pretty neat. Uh, it's actually pretty cool. Yeah. Um, other questions here. What have we got? HA proxy says the jail information is static files. Yes. Um, so wouldn't it be nice if you could query some sort of JSON endpoint and get a live jail description of what's running? Um, that would be really nice. Um, the thing I've found whenever I run lots of jails is that over time, the jail.conf file presents you the configuration that you think the system has, but not the configuration that the system actually has. Um, and reconciling that is always problematic. So if we had a daemon, if we had something that provided that information um, yeah. via some sort of socket or API, then that would be less of a problem. But in the end, what, what I found is if if you can so, deterministically create things like the the path for the jail by a hash of a name, if you can, um, you can. ensure that the IP address is also linked to a deterministic um, property, then you don't have to have the jail daemon and you don't have to rely on things being in an unexpected state because everything eventually ends up as a file or a socket that you can check to see if it exists. And that's been good enough. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's been good enough. Uh, what I meant with that is you could have something uh, via the exec hooks at the right part uh, during a jail startup or teardown, have it register with its a local HA proxy so that it joins the pool of potential instances of this service to be monitored mm. for health tests. Uh, and then during the pre-stop, it would be deregister itself with HA proxy, wait for the, if you want, you can even wait for the sessions to drain for some seconds. Mm. And then you would put in the stuff as the jail hooks uh, encounter the state updates. But of course, in theory, root could go crazy and randomly p-kill your processes. Yep. So for that, you will still kind of need some kind of monitoring, also known as slow and annoying uh, polling. Yeah, exactly. To, uh, basically, uh, have your what in the Linux world would be called your um, emulation loop in Kubernetes or something. And mm. you just have to discover the actual state of the system. But just relying on Auto discovery and uh, a five star cron job running every minute. Five star cron job will run again. Um, you don't want to wait for this to detect your services, and you don't want partial to detect partially started or stopped services. So that yeah. this is where the hooks come in, so that you get immediate responses. The, th the thing with the hook is it tells you the state of the jail, but not the state of the application. 
So the general uh, idea was good. No, um, that's not quite right. You have hooks the inside the jail, and yeah, and you have the post start one, which is when the startup script in the jail has uh, run to completion. At which point you, the services should be up and running at least far enough that you can register it for health monitoring. And I would consider it a misconfiguration if it's not up and running and ready to pass the health check at that point. So where, when there is nothing broken during the post start hook execution, uh, the service should be uh, healthy and available. In, in theory, yes, and in practice, no. So the only <laughs> yes. thing that knows if the application is ready is the application itself. And it has a bunch Which of Which is things. why you ask um, it. Well, we, that's right. So the, the, the question here is, do I need to put this um, this information into the the jail framework or do I want to put in the application? Because I'm, I'm going to have to have it in the application eventually. So the way I do that at the moment is the application themselves announces and says, I am, I'm ready for taking traffic. The, the main front-end ones do that with BGP. They do their own BGP announcing. Um, and the other ones um, will do that um, with sending a message to HA Proxy saying, I, I am up and ready for traffic now. Um, we don't have, this isn't like a Kubernetes environment with you know, thousands and thousands of containers or tens of thousands. So I don't need that much, um, what's the word for it? that much dynamic behavior, yeah. Uh, but there's plenty of places. You can put the hooks in the jail framework, you can put the hooks in the application side, and you can also have the health checks in, um, in the proxy layer as well. The, the main thing that is tricky here is I would like a way to announce to another node that this jail is up and running. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that that's not so straightforward um, with with the way this is being put together. I've not put really any thought into solving it, but um, that, that's something that isn't possible with this set of shell scripts today. Um, what other questions have we got here? Uh, well, you could uh, expose the HA proxy health information because it sounds like that's where you're taking your application readiness or availability information from by um, having a proxy uh, ask its health endpoint and then you get a aggregate of all registered backends. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the inverted way of what we would need. We need a way for the jails to say, uh, let's say on this system, um, uh, jail is created. We need to tell other HA proxy instances that this thing is up. So yes, it's not that I want to get the state from HA proxy. Uh, I need to collect tell... the state from other HA proxies, so, but yeah, it's the it's the other way around. I need to tell HA proxy on a different server, hey, this this thing is up. Yeah, um, not so. I not think so you can. I think what you could do is uh, put this health state in a memcached or Redis, and have them all uh, push to that. Yeah, so this is the classic, as an Erlang programmer, which is Erlang is a language designed for distributed systems, I find that inherently wrong. This is like, why don't I introduce a third technology that I then rely on to keep the state? And what I, I don't want that. I want the system to say, um, I am running and I'm active. And that's where BGP has proven to be absolutely the perfect fit for this because that's what it does. It announces that a service is ready. So where I can, our main production stuff uses BGP for that and the application tree um, starts up, connects its database, does whatever else it needs to do to prepare, and says, okay, I'm ready to do stuff. And its final step is to announce um, via BGP that it's ready. Um, questions here. Um, how much KHDB, KHDB data do we have? Um, it's not um, super big in this one. My previous one was much bigger, um, but this one is um, probably just. Um, a few gigabytes, um, and um, let me think here, views. Um, views are actually less. We have less um, indexes than we do um, database stuff. The biggest couch views I'm aware of are in the petabyte range, so very, very big, um, and they do genome data. 
um, for one of those evil companies. Yeah. Um, so some of them are pretty big, and CouchDB itself is IBM's um, uh, NoSQL cloud is actually CouchDB. So the, yeah, big big scale. Um, how much traffic do I push per tap interface? Peanuts in this environment, absolute peanuts. Um, I've not done any detailed testing, but um, I think I tested like um, something like is it 500 megabits a second or something like that through it. Have I got that right? Um, up to 70% of the interface's raw capacity on a, on a 25 gig NIC, um, and that's fine. Um, it copes with that. Um, previous versions of Deater, zero tier, go back maybe three or four years, and it would have keeled over easily way before that. Um, the CPU usage gets quite high on small boxes. I don't have any small boxes left, but a, a small box being like um, like a four core type thing, and um, the encryption is is um, requires effort. Um, but that's made huge leaps and um, and bounds in the last few years, and I don't see that as being a limiting. Um, factor anymore. Um, what are you still using BGP for? Um, IBGP. So we rely on the the vendor, the the, the networking vendors, to provide the public facing BGP magic. And from my perspective, all the traffic arrives in a data center, and then we use ECMP um, because what equal cost multi path route um, multi path routing to um, hash the traffic out and send it to the various nodes that are up and running. Um, again, this total volume is not very much from our perspective, not one on what people would think of large traffic volumes. Um, it's just a very, very nice way of, of handling the traffic. And as soon as we bring down a BGP announcer on a given service or a given server, then the traffic just drains and the next node um, picks up the traffic. Um, what else have we got here? Yeah, so Skunkworks is my little um, company that does a bunch of things. And we've got some uh, private customers and some services ourselves, which we host um, in um, this infrastructure and a couple more that are pretty similar to it. Yeah. What else? Any other questions? I have sort of irrelevant comment, but uh, I would love to learn more about experience running Elixir slash Erlang OTP stuff uh, at scale. I've heard a lot of good things about this platform, and I've read the books, but never use it myself. But so oh, it's, a lot, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Like, um, the, the the danger that I'd love to show some stuff live, but um, it's it's not. Um, uh, get some private data in there that's immediately visible. But yeah, happy to chat about that some other time. Um, I'm going back, I'm going to Elixir Conf in a couple of weeks. Is it a couple of weeks? Um, so I'll come back from that all enthused. So yeah, so it, Elixir, let's just have a very, very quick. Um, uh, yeah, can you broadly describe the applications? Yeah, um, so um, what have we got? So one of these is like a pretty, you can imagine Rails, like a Rails application. Um, there's a couple of those sort of things. Um, so pretty standard web um, framework. Um, there is, what else have we got in here? Um, uh, a sort of a, like a message queue sort of thing. Um, it accepts traffic from various systems, um, looks at them, decides what to do, and sends them to other systems and buffers them in between. Um, what else have we got? Um, I think they're handling a lot of web hooks. And when I say a lot of web hooks, I mean like um, like 100,000 requests a second type a lot of web hooks. Um, and it has to do some clever stuff. It has to go, um, is it secure? Is it coming from a trusted IP? And we have to do the sort of the checks as, as fast as possible before we hand them over to the long, slow things, which is, um, does it have a valid HMAC? And then finally, um, it's coming from a trusted source. Um, it's not hit a rate limit. Uh, the HMAC is, which is an expensive calculation comparatively to check the, to, to hash maybe like um, oh, up to about sort of 10 megabytes of data. Um, and then finally at the end of it, um, um, we actually do 
is this valid JSON? Uh, and then we pass that, and then we do some stuff with it, and we shove it. We actually shove it into CouchDB. Um, and as soon as it's in CouchDB on a single node, we reply back to the user that we've got it. So CouchDB is um, eventually consistent, and we've designed the application in such a way that if a single node accepts the right, we know there are no conflicts um, because of the way the um, the the uh, a little bit of deterministic um, calculations of the of the of the um, primary ID, and then we can um, wait for the other nodes to catch up. So we return a two hundred back to the user saying, "Got your stuff," and then in the background we shuffle it around to other nodes, replicate it, and eventually do other things with it. Uh, what else is in there? Oh yeah, there's a DNS server. I almost forgot. Um, we have a um, a custom DNS server written in Erlang um, for some projects which are not finished, but hopefully this year, probably definitely this year, but hopefully in, in three months we'll be ready for that. And I can talk more about it later. Um, but that just does DNS stuff. Um, Erlang is a a good language for doing DNS stuff in, but it's not a great language. It's not memory efficient and it's not C fast, but um, it's a very, very nice language for doing distributed systems in. Um, what are three unusual things about it? So when I talk about Erlang and Alexia, these are really the same virtual machine. It's like Java and Clojure. It's the same virtual machine. Um, it's a functional programming language. So there's no shared state. Um, which is not quite true, uh, but there's no shared state available. If you, there are no pointers. If you want to send a message to another process, if you want to communicate with to another process, you have to send a message. Um, there's no shared state that you can that you can access. Um, so there's no memory corruption bugs. Other than that, the back end, the VM is all written in C. So of course, there's still the possibility of of, of bad C getting you. But the programming language itself, the runtime, um, is is a very much a JVM barcode. The really unusual thing is addressing a local process is the same as addressing a remote process. So aside from the latency differences and the throughput differences, um, you can access code and data on another machine just as you can locally. Um, and uh, the virtual machine provides a bunch of uh, libraries, which we call OTP, the OTP libraries that encapsulate um, trusted behaviors. So things like a supervisor process that makes sure subsidiary processes are up, that starts more of them if they're needed. That's part of this core framework. And that framework can be spread across multiple machines. So you can have a supervisor process on one node that makes sure other nodes are up and running and processing uh, transactions. And if you look at inside CouchDB itself, that's how CouchDB communicates across nodes. It says, um, I've got a request. I know I can't service all the requests locally because I only have the shards for this part of the database locally, but I know that other people do. So I'll send a message to them and um, those nodes then send back the native Erlang data format um, back to the this node that's handling the request and it consolidates and sorts and then turns this data back into JSON and sends it out to the other node. And that um, RPC layer is actually really neat. These days in Go, people would use like gRPC for this. So um, in some ways, Go provides a lot of the same sort of um, primitives in the programming language, but it doesn't provide the same guarantees. And um, this is something that Go, in my opinion, will never be able to do because it's not designed in the semantics of the language. It's something you try to add on afterwards. Yeah. Anyway, it's not an Erlang day today, so but hopefully that's a bit of a flavor. Distributed systems, multiple nodes, um, and a bunch of frameworks that allow you to build reliable, robust, um, yeah, composition, compositioning. Any other questions? I think I got to the end of my notes, didn't I here? Yeah, <laughs> that's my, my final comment is how do I feel about this stuff I built? Too much YAML in the Ansible, too much duct tape 
um, there's all these little shell scripts covering over little ugly sharp corners. And the main thing I struggle with um, with this is it's it's not resilient. Um, every uh, couple of years, something changes in Ansible um, and breaks, and then you're down in those um, curly brackets that you didn't touch for two years going, what was I thinking here? What is it supposed to do? Um, yeah. And I think all the other stuff we've already talked about in our, in our calls previously. Yeah. But one, one other thing I didn't make, I didn't make clear here. Um, the ideal situation is to have a distributed registry. Maybe no, it's not part of jails itself, but a distributed registry where you can query things like say, tell me, all the nodes that have a jail named foo or tagged foo on it that has foo jails present and order them by um, proximity to me. So um, which ones are closest so I don't traverse the world looking for looking for these systems. Um, and to me, that, that layer is a very natural fit for um, Erlang or Elixir, this distributed view of the world. Um, so all I need then locally is a way to tag individual jails and request their, their status. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for exploring this design space so thoroughly and reporting back with years of <laughs> real world experience. Yeah. <laughs> All right, my plan is I'm going to use this. Um, so I've, I had some more thoughts after doing this. I'll, I'll definitely um, do a propose a, a EuroBSD con talk on this. Um, splitting some of these pieces out. But I think yeah, the main just... takeaway for me is jails made this so easy, really with ZFS and jails, it becomes so easy to manage stuff. Um, it, it, it's hard to explain to people who haven't had to deal with this, with a, uh, a, a group of Linux systems with people who are not developers um, and trying to explain them how you roll back a Docker system. Um, or a, a cluster of Docker servers. And here we go, okay, this is really simple. You have a shell script with three lines that queries the jails, the systems that have these jails. You go ZFS rollback to the previous version, and then you restart the daemons. And people are going, okay, that's easy. I can, I can, I can grasp that. Um, and operationally, it's been very, very low touch. Well, arguably, in, in Kubernetes world, it's also easy. You just... Uh, roll back the tag on your Docker container and your Kubernetes just spins up a bunch of previous... It does now, yes. Um, so I didn't actually mention that. When we started this project, um, what I didn't cover is we were, why did we go all free, free BSD? Um, and the short answer was because people had, now this was in 2016, people had said, oh, Kubernetes, let's do Kubernetes. And so they spent a year trying to do Kubernetes and Docker. And I don't know if you recall back then, how new it was and how fast it was moving. Yep. Um, and we could never keep up. And so I wrote a blog post at the time, like my infrastructure should be boring and, and it should be. I don't want, I'm not getting paid to think about infrastructure. I'm getting paid to build an application and deliver um, a web service to, to users. And we were spending all this time trying to Kubernetesify the stuff. And I think there were, I think three people working on it at the time trying to do that and not keeping up and this whole FreeBSD jails migration was um, less than six months. And um, the performance difference is huge. We went from, which is not a property of, I shouldn't be clear, that's not a property of Linux. It's a property of having, going from um, you know, 30 or 40 VMs down to just three physical servers. Um, the application was over 10 times faster for logins. Um, it was a massive, massive difference. Um, and it's nothing to do with Linux or FreeBSD. It's just um, there is a cost to latency. That is definitely uh, just a lot more expensive than <laughs> what uh, operating system level virtualization like container containers or zones or jails. So I didn't catch that, Jan. What was that? The virtual machines with a Type 1 or Type 2 hypervisor are a lot uh, heavier than jails or Linux containers or Solaris zones. Uh, zones. Yeah, totally. I think the main, the main advantage here was localhost. We moved from having 
VMs that were managed by DigitalOcean and um, I can't remember mm. the other two providers down to localhost. <laughs> and that was that was the key thing. Don't yeah. get me started on DigitalOcean and their uh, incompetent network operating team. Yeah, I the IPv6 also... address plan is atrocious. Um, we refuse to acknowledge that they drop UDP packets if both source and destination IP uh, port are below 1024 and identical. Over oh, IPv6. really? Yeah. So, <laughs> for example, uh, you can't do uh, IPsec ALK yeah, over IPv6 yeah. on DigitalOcean because the initiator and the respondent will use port 500 mm. and then they say well we have discovered that we are using ipv6 there is no net so i don't will not use um net transversal over port 4500 so it basically looks they look at each other see that they're not nutted and try to establish a direct ipsec um security association yeah and i had the I escalated it as far as I could three times until someone at least acknowledged, yeah, well, that shouldn't happen, but I have no idea why it does happen. <laughs> yeah. That was that's... the day I uh, closed my account. Uh, I, I can also speak to the uh, fact of the uh, boring infrastructure thing that they've touched on. Um, even today, Kubernetes is still a tar moving target that is difficult to keep up with, especially if you're running more than one cluster in a company that is not, you know, three or ten engineers, but in a larger company. Offline, off the record, I could share some war stories and, and horror stories about managing Kubernetes. So I can definitely. Uh, uh, appreciate the fact that FreeBSD is a, a lot more stable platform. Yeah, I think um, what problems we've really run into that were nasty. Nothing in, in years. Like it's been the, the first year, there were a couple of things. I made a mistake with some PF rules, um, and that took, I think, a good couple of weeks to track down. Um, but um, I thought I was expanding to a sing. I, I thought I was using a single outbound IP address, but in fact, um, because of the way I'd misconfigured PF, um, it was using multiple outbound IPs, and so the requests um, going out with like uh, like HTTP requests. Um, I forget now the exact problem, but one and one and only one and three curl type requests would actually function. And the other two would just get cut off because um, the firewall rules only permitted one outbound IP, but the PF um, rule set expanded to to three IPs, only one of which was allowed. That took a long time to figure out. Um, and in the jail side of things, my only main takeaway was in the beginning, I had um, data sets. Uh, sorry, I had the jail itself mount the file systems. And that just proves fine most of the time until it doesn't. And so now we pre-mount all the data, all the all the um, the mount points um, in the host OS once, and then the jails come up and down as needed, and the file system stay mounted. Um, That's much can much you, simpler. Can you elaborate on the pre-mounting. Do you? When you say you're pre-mounting, uh, you mean that you're not using the jail.conf, uh, you know, ways of mounting things into the jail and, and doing it in some other way? Or do you mean when jail mount, it mounts something itself is that the process that is already in the jail issues mount commands? Like, it's not No, the jails don't do any mounting themselves inside the jail. There's nothing. Um, maybe, I don't even think TempFS. Uh, I can't, probably can't show that. I can't show the more complicated one, unfortunately. Um, do I? Uh, yeah, I'll see if I can find something for, for next week showing what this looks like when you have like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of jails 
um, <laughs> or running with this because that's actually pretty cool. Um, but what the problem you have is eventually something um, something gets out of sync. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a jail thing or if it's a, a mount thing. And then you have a mount or an unmount that fails. Mm -hmm. And by the time you realize this has happened, um, hundreds and hundreds of jails have been and gone. By the time, as an operator, you get to know that this is a problem. And it's just very messy. <laughs> it's very um, messy. Luckily, it's all ephemeral jobs, so you can just stop the system that, that's impacted and let them run um, like a minute or two later on another node when that, that problem is resolved. But uh, so, yeah, so the solution is mount all the jails outside um, the host, um, use ZFS clones as much as possible, um, and this pain just disappears, and I haven't had to think about it for ages. I've encountered oh. problems like these during jail shutdowns if the um, – if it tried to unmount a file system while there was still a file system mounted inside it. Um, so if I used um, too, far too clever null FS mounting tricks and then the null FS wasn't unmounted because it was still flushing and then the whole uh, unmounting of the other file system failed. Yeah, so so, I I would love to know if there's a way to see what's actually holding that open at the time. But I think by the time we look um, at it, it's always too late. Yeah, but that's that's kind of what I'm expecting. There's some process that's flushing or hasn't finished dying yet, and the other stuff is is already ahead of it, trying to shut down and try to unmount file systems, and then one of them fails. But and all uh, over. what you can do in a in your startup hooks, uh, you can just uh, use mount uh, with the FS tab from the jail, if you're reusing the paths, uh, to make space tell that unmount all file systems mentioned in this FS tab, for, uh, the jail's FS tab. And then basically, if you're re reusing the jail mount point location path, then you make sure you clean up before you uh, mount it. It's a bit ugly. You shouldn't have to do it, uh, but it's defense in depth. The other option is to uh, use the jail ID as path or a part of your, uh, your jail path and in the mount points and so on. This has the advantage that um, you're never reusing any paths. So at worst, you would mm. leave Dale mounts uh, there and you could debug it at your leisure. I probably can. Let me just uh, show you an example here. So I go. I think the root causes of that we've already discussed at one of the previous meetings is the fact that there is a split state management between kernel and jail utility. Mm. Yeah. So here's actually what we're doing. Um, here's what one example. I don't know how current this is. This is an old one because it doesn't have a timestamp. Um, so it must be several years old. But um, we get this uh, web hook in, and um, these two bits, org and URL, actually come from some other database. But then we hash, I think it's the, the URL, because it's untrusted user input. So we generate a, like a, whatever that is, mm -hmm. SHA-256 hash or something like that from it. And the ID um, is generated from the request of the document body hashed. And then this here, I don't know what that comes from, <laughs> but um, that's actually what we use for the jail. Um, um, we clone a ZFS data set with that, and then we make a jail from it and mount all the bits inside it. And we know that's unique to this request because um, because this deliciously long hash mm -hmm. and that, um, that that we avoid most of these problems uh, that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
I'd have to look up the code to see what <laughs> what we derive that cache from. But um, basically, we get untrusted user data. We use this to give us uh, use that, and I think maybe the ID to generate the cache URL, and that actually becomes the clone data set for that's the base for the jail. Um, you mentioned the lack of um, clean separation be between different types of gels and tagging and so on. Um, you may have an easy uh, tool at your hand since you're already using Zero Tier. Uh, Zero Tier can ta attach tags to nodes and it can um, even uh, have signed sub uh, flow rule sets ca called capabilities. Uh, so mm. note notices that the default rule set will not allow the packet through which it wants to see send. It checks its cap capabilities and includes the uh, capability if, the, if it has one. Otherwise, it won't. It will just drop the packet locally if it's an honest node. Mm. That you can have a very very short um, stateless rule set in your flow uh, engine but uh, you can use it almost like a stateful firewall uh, if you yeah. the state tracking the TCP sta stack. So what you would do is you would block all TCP packets, which are required for uh, the establishment of new TCP sessions, basically doing a break characteristic TCP soon and not a characteristic TCPX. So any packet with a, Sun, but not a, a Sun egg, um, which is how you establish a new TCP session. Yeah. And then you would break this, but let through all the other TCP flow, uh, relying on the kernel to have a proper TCP state engine, which it does these days. And this would look something like this. The first will make sure you're only using the uh, six plane this here, the next one um, chops off uh, the establishment of new sessions. Then you allow through established uh, sessions. And in the end, um, you have these capabilities and they could uh, look, let me use a harmless example, something like this. And if you just fall off the end with a break, and which is the default instead of a deny, uh, the rule set allows the nodes to use capabilities, which are signed by the controller, to yeah. on demand extend the uh, rule set, which is feels almost like a stateful firewall. Yeah, so we didn't talk much about about this in, in, in zero tier land. So when I first started using zero tier, this didn't exist, um, but it's been there for a long time, and um, two or three years, I think, since it began. Yeah, um, the only place I currently use use this is to um, ensure that only the three um, database cluster nodes can talk to each other over the, um, mm -hmm. uh, for want of a better word, the direct access so um the only way to get for, for everyone else for all other applications to get to couchdb they need to talk um to ha proxy mm -hmm. um but zero tier itself actually provides the enforcement of the rules that these three nodes um are only the nodes that can talk to each other um the main catch for us here has been that i would need to have um a separate network for every customer ideally for this um, course, but, this is, and, uh, but it would be nice and secure it'd be very good but the key thing it is doesn't cost any the... extra and it would actually probably improve your performance because you have a thread uh, per um, tab interface so you can push uh, through the performance bottleneck of the tab interface uh, per tab interface yes yes um although yeah i don't i don't really have any current need for masses of i mean really the, the practical limit is you can push like 750 you know you can 
you don't need to go up to 10 megs. We could definitely get like um, 5G without any problem today. So if you have yeah, fast to be your course. I do. Yes, I do. Yeah, that is definitely a requirement. So yeah. It doesn't help you if you have uh, hundreds of CPU cores if the individual uh, per thread throughput isn't high enough. Yeah, and that, that's at that point I would need to switch to um, to something else. Yeah, this has kind of been one of the main questions. So one thing, final uh, sort of thing that's worth talking about this is um, why not WireGuard? And the two key things that Zero Tier does that I don't get from WireGuard is the first one is um, that. The setup is ridiculously easy in jails. It was literally, you create a zero tier network um, and you can assign the IP to a jail and you're done. That's all the configuration there is. It's incredibly simple to, to deal with. And mm -hmm. I like that for infrastructure. Um, and it provides you the mesh. So even if one node is down or one route is down, zero tier figures out really quickly and traffic just magically goes around the blockage like the internet is supposed to but doesn't actually do in practice um, sometimes. Um, and with WireGuard, you don't have that mesh, um, so it doesn't do that. So you get encryption, that's great, it's very fast, it's in kernel, that's also very great, but you don't get the mesh topology. And if mm -hmm. you use something like TailScale, which does give you that mesh, then it also does that by a ton tap. So you're back to, <laughs> mm -hmm. you're back to square one. Um, and um, we've used zero tier for all sorts of uh, weird and wonderful things. Um, what's a good example? Oh yeah, so we have some developers um, who have Macs and they like to travel around because mm -hmm. why not? If you've got no, if you've got no kids, then there's nothing stopping you. And we have them um, when they do a deploy, um, it gets pushed to a node and. Um, they just go to an IP address. Sorry, it's not an IP address, uh, a DNS name, and it happens to be over zero tier, and it just works. Um, nowadays, that's um, standard in sort of any um, CI type cloud deployment, but um, we've we've had that now for, I guess, six or seven years, uh, and it just works all the time without really any fixing. Um, what else? Uh, there's a nice little tool called TTYD. I'll share a link to it. It's in ports. And um, I use that for doing like peer programming or debugging stuff with somebody. So the host name is always the same. Uh, can I do it here live? Is that, um, I think, I can't remember if I've got all of this set up. But TTYD uh, starts. Self-host yeah. uh, teammate, right? If I go like that, I've got the plumbing right. It'll take a minute or two to figure out that it's up. Uh, I might not have got the ports right. No. It's the thing with an unprepared live demo. I've, I've done something wrong. But um, TDYD comes up here, and there's an HA proxy that just... Um, it doesn't have a health check in it, but it checks when there's a connection and it just says, okay, look around the infrastructure and try and find one of these that's listening on port 7681. And if it is um, proxy traffic to it, and it just works. Or it would do if I got the IP address right, whatever I've done wrong. Um, and that's just been fantastic for debugging stuff because um, you SSH to the box that has the thing that isn't working you start TDYD um, and then you share the link to someone else and say, here is the thing, and you can look at it together. Um, and it's really nice and fast. TDYD is great for this. Um, WebSockets, plain text, it's not doing um, a full screen share. And that relies on CO here behind the scenes to, to do the right thing and figure out which node is up. Yeah. Anyway, that's enough for me today. Um, so what would you change in jail to make this easier? What's missing? What's oh. let you down? Because it sounds like jail's treating you really well. They are, yeah. Let's, let's not get this wrong. I'm not coming here to win. This has been fantastic. <laughs> um, I think the number one thing I would take away is the stability of the jail stuff has just been tremendous. Um, I can think, if I ignore the fact that I run current, personally, the production stuff doesn't. I don't think there's ever been a problem, really, um, apart from the mounting stuff. 
the main thing I wanted was the sort of dynamic stuff here. Um, JSON API via Unix socket, user space jails. I would love user space jails. Um, kernel enforced single UID jails. I don't know how that would actually be. Um, it could be a Mac framework thing. It could be something else. I don't know. But um, I would like uh, the ability to create jails, not the networking stuff, not the firewall stuff, but just the jail itself as a user. And the kernel should make sure that you can only run um, non-root processes in there, which in my world would make breaking out of jails basically impossible. Um, yeah. Um, kernel force UIDs, we actually talked about this and it's there. I just didn't know. Um, <laughs> I guess I would want the jail tool to say, instead of assigning uh, the the... Yeah, I, I, the jail tools should be able to use UUIDs as names and not just a JID um, to, to talk to each other. Um, what else have I got in here? Yeah, so I've done some experiments with this. This is something for another day. Um, but I wanted to know, can you package a jail up so that you can go package install my jail thing and have it appear? And the answer is kind of yes, you can, um, but not in the make files that we use in the FreeBSD ports tree today. But if you use package create yourself, you could put a little bits in there to do it. Um, and I experimented with this little hack where um, package create, you'll have the package create doc sandy with my package create secret notes. Uh, find here. Okay. Yeah, so package has these posts read postscripts and you can write a little bit in there that says look for the data set called jails um or the, the, look for the thing that's mounted at slash jails and if it's if it's a zfs thing then create a new data set the subsidiary of that and you do this before um the jail is installed and then jail does sorry before the package is installed and then package does its normal unpacking of stuff into the mm predetermined location, but that happens to be a ZFS data set. And so you can actually deploy your templates um, for your jails instead of the Ansible mess I, I currently have. Um, you can deploy them directly by a package, um, which is pretty cool. Um, but I didn't really solve the upgrade story for this. Um, so I haven't I haven't moved further with that. But that'd be pretty cool. Um, Mm. Alan Jude asked me, I think, like a couple of weeks ago, why do you want to use package for jails? And I couldn't remember at the time, but the answer is because package is really easy. Everybody in FreeBSD uses it, and it already supports signatures. So you have a trusted path that you've already established for, for downloading and fetching stuff. Um, and that would mean that my application deployments would look like package install my jail foo, and then the foo application would be there and all of its jail glory ready to go. Uh, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Um, Maybe not a great you, idea, but um, it's... it's... That is a really interesting idea because we have talked uh, in these calls about the need for a format to exchange uh, jail templates or, and packages could be that agreed upon format uh, which does not belong to any single jail manager. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you could further decouple this by uh, looking for a data set tagged with a certain uh, user property instead of demanding that the file system is laid out in a exact fashion. You would have uh, some user property in the jail root data set to tag it. I'm not quite sure what you mean, but... Um, let's say someone wants to have his jails under user local and someone else wants them under slash jails directly. Someone else has them uh, yeah. under slash opt or under the name of their jail manager or whatever, mm. somewhere under user local something. Yeah, you could just put it in here. There's, there's, um, op there's space in here for optional tags. I can't remember. In um, the hook, I mean... Uh, 
in the yeah, but I, I, I meant it in the actual package itself. You could put random uh, data in here. I can't remember what the field is called, but you can put anything you like in mm -hmm. here, and then you'd be able to pull that out, yes. Or you could have uh, some uh, sim link to the mount point or something at a well-known location. Yeah. Are your um, jails complete user lands or fractional and minimal? Uh, they are all, what do we call them, fat jails okay. in my world. Yeah. I, th I think people sometimes get distracted. They go, okay, I've got to have thin jails. I'm going to save so much space. I'm going to see if this is compressible. And yep. um, one user application, uh, like, I'm just trying to think here. A typical application for us is around like 100, 120 megabytes of application. So that's less than, it's more than FreeBSD source. So why are you bothering? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it really doesn't gain you anything. Um, and right now they're all based off a single ZFS data set that is cloned. So um, it costs us nothing. <laughs> it really costs us nothing. Yeah. Um, the in, in my specific case, that's the big thing for us is um, I have complete control end to end of all of that. So I, I showed you briefly how we deploy the jails. We run this excoriate script. It just annihilates everything except the actual database files um, and, and the web files. And then we rerun Ansible and the jails are magically rebuilt with the new stuff on them. And the data just pops back into place. Demons are started and it just, it just works. I've experimented with um, snapshot and cloned jails in the past. The biggest problem I had with them was, first of all, you it only works if you're using immutable infrastructure approaches, so you can never yeah, rebase yeah. them. And the other thing which was really the uh, killer for me was that now your jail depends on the snapshot, so you can't really um, move your jail between hosts anymore. Because well, I think in my case, the data, it, uh, the, the, the data is persistent um, and separately. Hey, I need to dash out for a minute. I've just got to um, confirm my kids have done the respective stuff. So I'll be back in two. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Do you need to shovel to get rid of the evidence? Yeah. <laughs> Someone who is the conference manager can mute. Yeah, let me do that. Oh, mute. Yeah, well. Um, Jamie, when he gets back, I'd love to hear your observations on things like unprivileged jails and just basically going down his wish list. If there's any, to see if there's any like low hanging fruit there. Oh, okay, it was the uh, the three things: the uh, the unprivileged, the single UID, the address by UUID. Anything else in that? Or that's what I thought. Uh, let's wait till you get back, ID, but sorry? yeah. The, um, the one that you could re refer to UUIDs instead of uh, names for jails. Is this oh, and the kernel enforced UUIDs. The, uh, yeah, the, unique, the so, uniqueness of the UUID. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't... Uh non root jails implicitly get a single UID jails? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that too. I think that those are really uh, different views of the same concept. Well, there's a different Not basically. Do you want to have some kind One of... Time. Sorry. Uh, Jamie, did you have something? No. Okay. Uh, Igor, did you have something? I was saying that uh, uh, single UID jail and uh, you know non-root uh, jail is not necessarily you know one requires the other. It could be implementation detail, but yeah, it would be a nice security benefit if that was the case. But it can also be a limiting factor if you want to run you know like a full blown operating system in your jail as a user. Um, so I can see it being done both ways. It just really depends on what use cases we want to support and want, what we want to avoid. 
And if you don't have any uh, set URD binaries to regain a root inside the jail, um, starting only as processes of a certain URD or attaching them after they have dropped this. No, you can't do it. So you would have to have a process which uh, attaches to the jail and then drops to a specific user ID. And that way you would have effectively a single UID uh, jail unless there is SU and sudo or something similar with a set UID binary a bit usable. Just setting the uh, set UID uh, disabled property in the data set should be enough to uh, solve this for ZFS jails to make sure there is no way to raise priority without a local root exploit. There is one thing that exists today. There is a sysctl that allows to disable root inside of the jail, meaning that you can have oh. a process with UID zero, but it will not have privileges. That is, it, it, uh, so does this apply to the, to the file system as well? And how does this non-root uh, root access the file system in that case? Is, does it get remapped to nobody, no group or something? And uh, that was one of the questions. The other is, uh, or does it just remove all of the other privileges root enjoys, like loading kernel modules, uh, writing to the kernel environment, variables, and so on? Uh, good questions. I don't have answers. I just know that this thing exists. I, I saw it the other day. Do you have the, the, the exact name of that syscontrol? I'm looking up. Cool. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, post it because that's if part of it's done, it's done. <laughs> and Dave, let us know when you're back if you hear this. Cool. Oh, I bet it just keeps you're muting back. me. Yeah, yeah well, I muted you once because we had you and the kids in back. So. Um, <laughs> okay, oh. awesome. So it wasn't Are you sure yeah. you're not confusing with, with the unprivileged uh, change root support? No, that's different. I know there is two unprivileged operations that are sort of jail or at least sandboxing related. Unprivileged root, and there is also VFS user mount, which allows users to mount stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, just give me one more minute. I will yeah. find it. Go ahead and find that. Dave, I asked Jamie what his thoughts were on, say, that unprivileged jail operations and what that might look like. Plus yeah. the UUID so the, the, handling. The use cases I had in mind for this was um, the kernel enforced single UID jails is actually web processes because um, the two sort of entry points to our system, one of them is... Um, Standard web server stuff. That's that's our number one concern for compromises. Um, and if inside the jail we have no actual networking, we just have um, a Unix domain socket. We can support the HA proxy connection with that, so it has no network access. And um, for the applications themselves, they have no, uh, they don't need any um, file system write privileges. So if the process itself can't spawn, if there's no way to escalate privileges, there's no way to get file descriptors in, then it's very secure. And the only thing we have there is, okay, um, making sure there's only a single user in there. The other one is slightly trickier, which is um, doing CI stuff. We spin up a jail, we throw some tools in there, um, and then we run stuff. And we'd really like that jail to have two properties. The first one is, that irrespective of what the user tries to do, there should be no way for them to end up with another UID. And we don't really care how brutal or or grotesque the system is that enforces that. It just should be there. There shall never be processes other than this UID in that jail. Um, and the other part of this was when you do this uh, at a reasonable scale with untrusted code, um, I think of this as um, malware as a service, but now probably it's crypto mining as a service. That's what people do CI for. Um, you want to make sure that each um, invocation of a, of a, of a jail, of a, of a CI build, um, has a unique user ID, or at least not the same as the other jails are concurrently running. And... Um, that's a little bit tricky, uh, tricky at the moment. You have to have a registry of user IDs that are in use. Um, and 
we looked at this. This is a few years ago now. We looked at doing this, and I think we tried the, tra- the same trick as with the um, deterministic jail names and IP addresses. We take the last um, sort of three or four bytes of um, of the hash and use those as as a user ID, so long as it's above, I can't remember, like 33,000 or something like that with some threshold. Um, if it's above 3,000, we could use it. And the only problem we ran into is that um, you then have to change the permissions on the file system every single time. And I mumbled something in a dark room to Alan Drew, wouldn't it be good if ZFS could do that remapping for you? So we would say, hey, ZFS, clone this data set. And by the way, when you do it, pretend that every time someone asks uh, for the UID, it just comes back with this one. Um, so <laughs> yeah. I... Um... The, Dug it's a bit like, in the FreeBSD history. Idea. And there used to be such a thing up to and including FreeBSD 6 called the UMAP file system. Uh-huh. And it was removed uh, once the virtual file system uh, moved out from under the giant lock. UMAP. Yeah. F- uh, Mount UMAP, F- uh, yeah, and it's uh, 6.4 was the last uh, FreeBSD version of it and included. The problem was that uh, sort of unmounting them and so on um, now required proper locking and nobody cared to uh, provide that. Yeah, no, I wanted to fix it. No, uh, exactly. And it was removed pretty late in the 7.0 development mm. to get the virtual file system out from under the giant lock and finally see some payoff for the all of the SMP uh, pains endured during FreeBSD 5 and early 6s. Yeah, mm. I missed all of that. Sorry to say. Um, yeah. Count yourself lucky. Um, but um, I only caught the last and tail end of it and basically I was told, no, 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 you don't ever want to uh, try a f- uh, 5 dot something release. Uh, don't, don't, don't. Um, <laughs> yeah. The only time I really used it was uh, when I tried to build my own uh, Juno S and virtual box and had to pass through this troublesome uh, episode on my way from 4.8. But um, it's not fun. And there's still a rudiment of this feature in the um, NFS code to do the remapping from root to nobody. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This, this was basically the, this feature as an um, overlay file system, but configurable to remap multiple users and groups. So the functionality should still be buried in there, but we saw, uh, probably have to uh, uh, assemble the council of elders to <laughs> find out how it ever was intended to be used for anything but NFS. Because uh, just uh, yeah. change routing uh, every, uh, change owning and change grouping every uh, file in a ZFS snapshot uh, to be cloned is not um, reasonable for any thing, even just a fairly minimal gel would be too uh, expensive. Oh, yeah, it would totally be. It'd be a tremendous performance hit. It would be brutal, especially as most of the change, but, the, um, the churning would be unnecessary. Exactly. Um, it would uh, duplicate all the metadata oh. because of the bubbling up to the uh, common root of the acyclic graph because it's still a path copying D tree at, in the, at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, the question is, do you really need unique user IDs uh, between jails? Because these are only meaningful to the host. And why does the host care about the user ID separated from the jail ID? There is still at least a, a, a few weird places with uh, resource limits that are tied to user where um, it the, sees it across jails. I know, uh, uh, yeah, like UFS quotas and some of the uh, mm-hmm. set. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, 
but the hierarchical uh, resource limits can also be scoped on jails. That's true. That that's true. That has been put in now. So. Okay, that explains why I never found the uh, root removal because it's called S user, not root or super user, just S user. Okay, yeah, that, that one. Okay, yeah, that makes sense, right. Yeah, it has nothing to do with not having the user ID zero. It still is the root user ID and that answers the file system question. Yes, it has all the root file system permissions. It just cannot do anything special system call wise. Um, but with the removal of special uh, system call privileges, this would also apply to uh, BSD flags. And while we don't have yeah. user immutable on ZFS because that was never implemented, um, we do have system uh, immutable, which uh, would then even apply to root without raising the secure level. Mm. Uh, and this could be used uh, to, if the uh, root user inside the jail isn't privileged, it couldn't remove uh, the, or abuse its uh, file system access to remove um, BSD flag system immutable at secure level zero and one. We've solved that problem by making the, the data set um, read only in ZFS. Exactly. Um, and because I don't have the jails, the jails inside aren't ZFS aware. Um, mm. That's solid. Yeah. I, I guess people would do that in the past with LFS read only too. Yes, oh. they've done that in the past and we're still doing that. It, and it's very useful to this day for uh, a Unix domain sockets uh, to be shared between different jails or jail and host. Yeah. I would say it's a good practice in general to just set secure level to three in your jail so that no system flags can be changed regardless of the root or mm -hmm. not. But regarding the, um, the configuration for enforcing uh, rootless single user jails, the problem is that at the moment a process attaches to the jail, it's still enters the jail as uh, UID zero, but by disabling its privileges inside and thereby implicitly those of all others. Um, and if you disable ptrace and so on inside the jail, uh, there would be no way ability to immediately attack the jail process from inside the jail to prevent it from dropping privileges. So it yeah. could work. I guess that's sort of the, the the logic for user space jails is there's a lot of things we do where we simply don't need root. We, we, we're um, you know, cloning some some Git stuff, um, shuffling things around with rsync or something, um, and we don't want to have to spawn a we don't have we don't want to have to have root to spawn a process that gets run in the jail. We just like to be able to say hey. I'm a normal user, please go and run this in my normal jail that's under my same user ID. So if you, you have the uh, normal user ID, normal users able to create the jails, is this tied in, and we were discussing this while, while you left for a moment, is this tied in with the idea of a jail only being able to have a single user ID or is these two different features? Um, I, I think the more I think about it, I think these are really the same thing looking from different angles. Um, one of them is a functionality thing. Like a um, today, we have you can troot um, as a user. I think it's great, and I've not really experimented much with it. But maybe that's already almost sufficient. Um, the enforcing, enfor yeah, I, I guess. I'm just trying to think back now because some of the stuff is like five five plus years old. One of them was looking at Mac frameworks. So there's this canonical problem we have. You create a jail and you drop an IP uh, uh, interface into it, but the root user inside the jail can change the Mac address, um, for example. So the solution yeah. for that is then you create a second jail inside, um, which totally works, but it's, it, it feels clunky. 
and someone wrote um, a Mac um, framework to, I can't remember now, it's either blocking the change of the Ethernet address or um, you can't change the IP address, it doesn't really matter. And I remember looking at that and going, oh, that'd be really handy if we could have that, um, but for user IDs, so you can't, you can't change user IDs. Um, Which does seem more like a Mac question than a jail question. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, and the second one was more from the point of view of these CI machines um, take these relatively untrusted jobs. Um, it's not that the jobs are untrusted, it's just that we're taking untrusted input from GitHub and who knows um, who knows what they could get up to there. Yeah. Um, and then we run commands based off that input. It was looking at trying to minimize the exposure there. And that was saying, well, okay, if at the moment we take this untrusted input and then hand it to root because we had to create the jail. And what we'd really like is to hand it to another user process, not, not a root one. Um, I think the, the trick of taking the user data today and, and, and hashing it um, is actually quite good. We, we're pretty sure after that, that we know precisely its length and we know um, that it contains only ASCII data. Uh, that's a good enough trick, but ideally we wouldn't need root to spawn the jail at all. And that problem um, becomes even less, less of a concern. So just to confirm here and now a, an unprivileged user cannot create a jail of any sort. Right, that is a root operation. Okay. And yeah. in order to make it so a unprivileged user could create a jail, it would, uh, I mean, it, it would be easy to do, but I would want to make sure I was doing it right. I, you know, that's, that opens potential holes that I'd have to make sure aren't a problem. Well, yeah, that's definitely a non-trivial thing. Yeah. Yeah. Linux had like five or six years of security vulnerabilities once they've enabled unprivileged user namespace on sharing. But, <laughs> but yeah, Linux okay. did a bunch of things to make the problem a lot harder and more dangerous because of they don't just partition the global namespaces, they alias and remap between them. So ah. we uh, talked about last week, you can have your own um, PID namespace. And if you, for example, if you have a container with its own PID namespace and a daemon running inside this container writes a PID file and something from outside the container looks in a privileged supervisor script to monitor the system, looks at the PID, sees, oh, the service doesn't work and sends a signal to the PID from outside the namespace. And yeah, because the pits don't match, right. And so you had lots of confused deputy problems in uh, production systems. And so we should really avoid ever doing this when we can, just uh, partition either recursive namespaces into subtrees uh, or uh, by hiding subsets of uh, flat namespaces and don't introduce uh, aliasing if you can avoid it. Unless it's really required because it causes so many problems because now there is a system call, call in Linux or some, even if, I'm not sure if it's a system call or if it's in some sort of file system to be read where you can look up the translation, but this is inherently racy and unless you're also the parent and so on. Uh, it can get very confusing. Yeah. This is the bit that I was, I, I think I failed to highlight in my previous meetings uh, uh, um, presentation is that the uh, Linux namespaces are fundamentally different in the sense that you can build completely disjoint view of the system. And then, yes, as um, as Jan says, it's like then you need to translate between, you know, bit outside of this namespace or inside of this namespace are two different things. Where in FreeBSD, it's always a subset of, of, of the system, right? So. Uh, I think we should keep it this way because that way we can avoid many problems that Linux was having. Yeah. 
The exception is where you have a complete new name space with no translation be, uh, between it, like uh, VNet, where you get a new network stack instance. But those yeah. don't share uh, the resources which could be translated because an interface, except for the uh, special purpose ePair interface, an interface is only in one VNet at a time. An ePair is a pair of interfaces and one half of the pair can be in each VNet. And yes, I know that uh, works can move, move packets between VNets, but that's uh, theoretical. So. Yeah. I know that uh, some stuff that uh, Bjorn Sape had done with private jail process spaces had gone the non-alias route and just made it so, you know, if, if jail had its own process space, then those processes were not visible outside the jail. What so like the, like the VNet interfaces, it, you know, they just do not exist anymore in the parent space. But uh, if we, there was a way to get back this, uh, Remapping at the file system level, where you get a new um, overlay mount point, which does the uh, translation of UIDs and GIDs, um, like the uh, old UMAP FS uh, did according to its uh, surviving man page. And this would be really useful then to have a feature on the host to basically reserve parts of the global UID uh, and uh, GID namespace to be partitioned to jail so that you can ensure that they're overlap free. Let's say uh, all I would reserve all uh, user and um, group IDs over 100,000 or something to be allocated somewhere else. And even the root jail, so wouldn't touch it. And then I could have a jail and assign it uh, 10,000 or whatever, or however many I need, um, user IDs and group IDs as the range for it to use. And the kernel would just enforce yeah. that uh, it can't, uh, even the privileged super user inside the jail can't do this and maybe some Thing along the lines of if someone attaches uh, jail attach implicitly is also a change in uh, credentials to something else. Because in that case, you probably want an atomic way to enter into the jail as a specific user ID or something. Maybe it would yeah, be yeah. enough to have the, a new jail attach system call to enter those jails, uh, which also takes the from the global namespace, but a part which has been reserved for use inside this jail, basically become this UID and GID and so on in this jail. And then the kernel would check that this jail is allowed to make use of this uh, range. So that uh, attaching to a jail and dropping your privileges becomes one atomic system call. Well, then, I mean, that might be a good idea anyway, even without the partitioning. Because if you have, uh, don't set the S user enabled bit and allow P trace and other things inside the jail, uh, root inside the jail could, in theory, exploit the race condition where a pr new process attaches and then mm -hmm. still maintain some privileges like file descriptors from outside the jail. <laughs> You know, I've got nothing more to add on that uh, right now, at least. It's it's uh, something, this this partitioning is definitely a, a new concept to me. The idea of the root system not being able to use something inside of the jail, it's always been the root's got the umbrella and the jail's got part of it. Yeah, I think so, it's, a much, it's a much nicer approach. I, I could imagine if you're running like an ISP, that might be a nice, not an ISP, uh, an MSP mm -hmm. that might be a nice thing to have, but fundamentally from a security point of view, I always want to know what's happening inside the jail, um, especially if it's one that's not directly under my control. Yeah, that, that's why I, I think the uh, previous these approach is better. Just keep, uh, jails are a subset of a 
host environment, whether it's another jail or just unjailed system. Mm -hmm. And uh, the outside environment can always look into the uh, jail. Um, so yeah, we should partition. We should. So in, in that sense, I think partitions are maybe not the right name for that. It's like the, we are not partitioning the. Uh, if we're talking process IDs, we're not really creating another partition with process IDs where we can have bit zero in both of them. We mm -hmm. are creating a, a view into into the, the same namespace, but just that one that has... That a is a problem. partition. But what we are doing in that case, if this is, gets implemented, would be to uh, take the global namespace, partition it, but in order to make sure that this partitioning has the semantic effect we want, we have to pre-allocate or reserve a large enough uh, range uh, did Jamie just rub off? No. Uh, so if no, we still here, uh, problem, because in theory, an accidental uh, fat finger uh, root on the host could accidentally use the host permissions to um, enter into a partition which has some is supposed to have some semantic attached to it, like it belongs to this jail. So what we need is a way to even in the host to not make it invisible, but make it unavailable. So you would see the process, but you couldn't set your effective user and group ID to it. I'm not sure it would be a good idea. Oh. Sort of violates the current promise of jails where root outside of the jail can always touch things inside of the jail. So it, it, this is a this is just a, this would only be um this isn't that the, he, he couldn't do something like send a signal to this or something but it's that you want to make sure that you even if for example you add, run add user and run out the end of your intended range because you your user creation script was triggered by some uh, infinite loop or something you don't want to ever run over the end and accidentally do this. And to make it usable that you could have uh, this untranslated view uh, of the user and group uh, ID namespace, uh, you need support from a virtual file system overlay to do the uh, translation at the VFS layer so that you don't have to modify the read-only uh, ZFS snapshot you want to share between dozens of jails running in different partitions of these namespaces. So instead you need a VFS view, which does the translation. Like the old UMAP ethics. Well, we are at two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. Is there more to explore there, or shall we perhaps? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, one, I, I do uh, have someone waiting on lunch now, so. Yeah, okay. So. That's what you need to hear that. The one feature I would like to see is uh, via the Mac framework or some way else to be able to limit what a non VNet jail can access on the network. Basically, say this uh, jail can only connect to uh, UDP. Uh, TCP ports range this uh, and these networks so that I could limit what which outgoing connections can be established by a jail. You can do that. You mean you want to add another firewall? In, no, the, the difference is <laughs> this wouldn't be implemented at the uh, packet <laughs> layer, but at the system call layer. Yeah. Where you already have all of the context to make it trivial to express your policy instead of that you have to find out, oh, this GL ID belongs to this, belongs to that, and so on. You don't have to do it then, because uh, uh, during the uh, connect or send message system call, you have all of this state at the right location in the kernel. You only have to basically look up a policy against this state and not I against the packet header. IPFW can already say, uh, you know, rules that, you know, this jail yes. can you know, do this or and that. And it gets applied to every 
packet matching this rule or matching against this rule, the jail ID uh, action. Yeah, so it, what, why what would I you... want, And so you have to have a firewall loaded, which is, and looking at every packet, which at tens or more of gigabits per second is very expensive to do. Uh, maybe you don't want to have even IPFW loaded and you just want to make full use of uh, LRO, TSO, and so on. And make use of all of the offloading engines available to you and just enforce it at the system call level where the connection would be established. I see. So that the uh, SOC, or, uh, the SOC address uh, provided to the system call gets matched against the policy instead of the packet header later on. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I can see what you're looking for, but I'm not sure that uh, it's it's really a, a jail question. It's a, uh, no, it's a, but a separate Mac question. It's a Mac and I, question. I really am. I'm sorry. I am going to have yeah. to leave now. Yeah, sure. So, Enjoy your lunch. Yeah. We'll see you next week. Okay, take care. Thanks for talking, everyone. Thanks. Yeah. Same, bye. Take care, bye. Okay, you're out. Um, on another note, I did look uh, deeper into libucl. Yes. And it, and I think uh, the uh, adding a slightly different version of the uh, include a macro to the uh, application doing the UCL parsing to expose it to the uh, jail config files um, would solve all of the problems of requiring repeating the jail name inside the config files. So that you could basically do a double indirection and that would take care of that so that you can have uh, shared identical configuration snippets between uh, related jails. But Andreas isn't here, so uh, <laughs> I guess I will have to implement it and hope I get it done. Well, yeah, take a week. That's great. Thank you so much. Okay, well, I say we call it quits and see you in a week. And some of you perhaps tomorrow for Beehive.